tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Both the United Nations and Canada have lost one of their best humanitarians. The deadly plane crash in Africa, remembering the 18 Canadian victims. We are uh, following up on this very, very carefully. Questions about the sophisticated new aircraft also. That's going to be pretty ugly here for a while. How yeah, not looking driver? forward to it. Gas line gridlock, construction causing headaches for Metro Vancouver drivers and businesses. And we'll just see what future holds. New mill, new optimism. Will a massive project on Vancouver Island reverse years of job decline? This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, a passionate environmentalist with a big heart. That is how friends are remembering Micah Misson tonight. The young Courtney man was aboard Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 when it crashed near Addis Ababa yesterday, killing all 157 people on board. Misson was in Africa to attend the United Nations Environment Assembly. He had announced the surprise trip on social media just one day before the crash. Uh, literally, my daughter, my wife, everybody started crying loudly, and it was difficult for me to handle them, too. Uh, very, very shocking. Very, very shocking. That sense of loss is also being felt in Brampton tonight after learning a family of six, two teenagers, their parents and grandparents also among the dead. A total of 18 Canadians were killed in this crash. The CBC's Cass Rusi now on how Ottawa is responding. I now invite all representatives to stand and to observe a minute of silence in honour of the victims. At UN headquarters in New York today, a moment of silence for the 157 people killed in the Ethiopian Airlines crash. 21 of the victims were members of the United Nations. Our colleagues were women and men, junior professionals and seasoned officials, hailing from all, corners, all corners of the globe. 18 Canadians were killed when the plane crashed just six minutes after takeoff. Among them, Ottawa native Jessica Haiba, who worked for the UN and recently was reassigned to Somalia's capital. Today, one of her closest friends says Haiba was excited to get back to work. Jessie is a brave, brave person. She's a superhero in herself. She's an incredible mother. She loved very deeply. She loved her family. She loved her friends. She is a humanitarian at heart. And both the United Nations and Canada have lost one of their best humanitarians. At the crash site, heavy machinery was brought in to dig out pieces of the wreckage while searchers continue to recover bodies. It's still not known what caused the plane to go down in clear weather, but with the recovery of two black boxes, officials hope to get some clues. Both Air Canada and WestJet say they remain confident in the Boeing plane. Still, the Air Canada Pilots Association is calling on Ottawa to take proactive action to ensure the safety of Canadians. It's very important not to jump to any conclusions about any possible causes. It's important for us to get to the bottom of it. We have the black boxes. It's important for us to determine the cause and then to take the necessary action, and we will do so. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. That wait-and-see approach means the 41 Boeing 737 MAX 8s operated by Air Canada, WestJet and Sunwing are still flying tonight. CBC's Dan Burrett is live at YVR tonight. Dan, you spoke with the passengers who traveled on that aircraft today. Uh, what are they saying? Anita, Mike, even if they're nervous, passengers say they are going to keep flying. There weren't many flights on the MAX 8 today out of YVR, but the Air Canada flight from Calgary to YVR landed around 4.20 this afternoon. Very few people were on board. Those we spoke with said that there was plenty of room for everybody, and they said they were well aware that they were flying in a Boeing 737 MAX 8. And while they may be a little more conscious of their safety, they still have flights to take. I, I guess you think about it for a second, but you know, in all the hundreds and thousands of flights, I mean, they're one of the best planes in the business, so not a, not an issue, really. It looked like a very brand new plane that we were on, so I felt very safe, and I like to think that our regulations are quite strict, so. Well, it makes you a little nervous, for sure. Um, you know, I, I watched Boeing take a big hit on their stock this morning, so 
Uh, hopefully they figure out what's going on with that aircraft. Air Canada uses 24 MAX 8s. WestJet uses 13. Air Canada said it's performed excellently, quote, and met safety and reliability standards. So while they will keep flying in this country, passengers will keep tanking them. As we heard, they have places to get to. But if anything, they're definitely more conscious of their safety. Anita, Mike? Dan, we're at live at YVR for us tonight. Thanks, Dan. Our Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. And in addition to being our meteorologist, uh, you are also a pilot. Yes, and Johanna, are there concerns about this model of plane? If so, what are they? Well, first of all, Boeing execs just earlier this evening stand by the safety of their 737 MAX 8s. And to be clear, the investigation is still ongoing. They have not hinted or declared any cause of this crash yet. But the reason why this particular plane is under so much scrutiny is the similarities between a crash that happened back in October, the Indonesia Lion Air crash, same plane that killed 189 people. So I want to take you back to pictures from that scene and talk about these similarities. So we were able to look at the flight profiles of both of these planes in their takeoff. Uh, we can get this information. It's publicly available from uh, Flight Radar 24. And in both of these profiles, it showed both flights had erratic speed readings and altitudes, both apparently nosedived in the final moments and the pilots of both aircraft uh, declared emergencies and asked to return to the airport. So in the case of Lion Air, uh, the flight data recorder, which is what we're waiting for, did show a connection to this MCAST system as a contributing factor. Now, uh, this system is designed to help prevent the aircraft from stalling in certain configurations when autopilot is off and when the flaps are up. And even though MCAS isn't the definitive factor in the Lion Air crash, it was shown to be a contributing factor. And this is why we're waiting for this uh, black box information. If we can uh, connect the configuration of Sunday's crash, uh, what kind of configuration it was in as far as autopilot and flaps, and make a connection to the Lion Air crash, then maybe we can start honing in on this MCAS data. This could take days. The final report could still take months. Uh, but uh, Anita and Mike, I've got to tell you, if in the next couple of days, we see that there are similarities. I imagine uh, the implications will be widespread. I imagine there will be major Canadian implications, and it'll happen very quickly. No doubt. Uh, still with MCAS, though, why is this feature presenting problems? This is, yeah, this MCAS system is, is at the root of both of these uh, incidents. So I want to take you back to pictures of the Boeing uh, 737 MAX 8. It all comes down to, the, down to this system. Uh, when Boeing set out to develop these new 737s, they had to find a way to fit a much larger engine, a uh, much more fuel-efficient engine, under the wing of a low-riding landing gear. So they had to move the configuration of the plane around a little bit. Uh, Boeing was able to achieve its goals of 14% fuel consumption, uh, but that changed slightly how the plane handled certain situations. Those relocated engines meant that in some situations, again, that autopilot and flaps up, uh, the nose had a tendency to rise. So this automated system would kick in, pushing the nose down. But a lot of questions after that Lion Air crash about why pilots didn't have that operating manual, weren't trained on that, and didn't know how to override it if there were certain uh, problems prior to uh, the incident taking place. And in the Lion Air case, it sounds like there were some uh, problems with the uh, instrument reading. So again, really waiting for this information to come out from those black boxes. Uh, but at this point, uh, the investigation continues. Hey, Joe, thanks for your insight. You're welcome. Well, it doesn't even really feel like winter is close to over yet, but construction season has already started. Yes, as the CBC's Zara Premji explains tonight, Fortis BC gas line work is back and reviving nightmares for drivers and businesses from last summer. Drilling, hammering, and a whole symphony of sound will be rippling through Coquitlam and Burnaby until at least the end of summer. It's going to be pretty ugly here for a while. We're running gravel trucks and this is delaying them by about a half an hour each round. So it does add up to dollars in our pocket that we can't recuperate. Sentiments echoed by Mike Rossetti, who says his business is still trying to recover from last year's natural gas line upgrades. At least it was down uh, 50, 60 percent at least. As he tries to keep his business afloat, he's battling with Fortis BC. Sales are definitely, you know, much slower than they have been, you know, in the past. And um, 
It's just uh, something we have to bear. But for drivers, they say that doesn't help them. The construction and all too familiar delay for many drivers who lived through it last summer when much of East First was ripped apart for the same project. That's about it, but what can we do? Not looking forward to it. Oh, you win some, you lose some. Fortis BC says these projects starting in Vancouver last year and into Burnaby and Coquitlam now will naturally cause an inconvenience, but it's a necessary one. I would tell people to plan ahead before they jump in the car in the morning and to just um, figure out the route that works best for them. Fortis says the upgrade work will grow capacity to serve more than 210,000 homes and businesses across the Lower Mainland. But Rossetti says he doesn't know how much more his business can take in the meantime. And when does it end? Zara Premji, CBC News, Burnaby. To Vancouver Island now, where an industry in decline is seeing a sign of rebirth. Ground will be broken on a new sawmill this spring in Port Alberni. And as Megan Thomas reports, it's welcome news after some very difficult years for the forest industry on the island. The trucks that roll through Port Alberni are a big, loud reminder of the industry that built this city. But hundreds of jobs have been lost in recent years at mills like this one. The Somas sawmill has been shut down since 2017. The very far left, the little building that's there. That Glenn Cheatham used to work here and is now a representative with the United Steelworkers. Probably back in 1981, there was like 1,200 members in the mill. And when I started in 1989, there was still 450 members. And it went down to about 70 members and then closed in 2017. But just a few blocks over, there's a ray of hope that Port Alberni has not seen in years. On an empty industrial lot, machinery has started to arrive for a new mill. Operated by a BC company called Sand Group, it will produce high-value finished wood products from smaller logs. The investment is pegged at $70 million and could bring about 100 jobs. Parallel to Rogers Street. All good news, says former Mayor Mike Rattan, who has been doing consulting work for Sand Group. Well, San is a remanufacturer, so they take every piece of wood that they, that they acquire and turn it into valuable product. This is very much the future of the industry. Squeezing out every bit of value out of that fiber. This type of processing of BC logs is also one of the province's goals for reforms to the coastal forest sector. Well, they're saying the right things. If the right incentives are there, and probably the right disincentives are there, it can all work. But some of the logs in Port Alberni don't go to the mills. They're loaded onto ships in the harbour as raw log exports, and changes are coming to the fees for these exports. And those who harvest the trees, like the Hoopichesset First Nation, are worried it will affect prices for all logs. As it stands now, where we sell to brokers, we get a very good price for our wood, and if that changes, the industry changes that with secondary milling and they give us, for example, prices just above pulp, then the economics for us are going to drop considerably. The province says changes for the coastal forest industry will be phased in over the next two years. Back at the closed SOMAS mill, Glenn Cheatham says the new mill down the street won't replace all of the jobs lost over the years in Port Alberni, but it's a start. Hopefully they... Uh can provide the uh, jobs that they um, say they are, they plan to and stuff like that, and we'll just see what future holds. Megan Thomas, CBC News, Port Alberni. Police are still searching for a suspect in an assault at UBC's Point Grey campus. Now they've released a sketch of the man. Police describe the suspect as an Asian man in his mid-20s, six feet tall, short, dark hair, dark eyes, said to have a square face and deep voice with a slight accent, and he may have scratches on the right side of his face and neck. Police say he smelled of cigarette smoke and was last seen wearing a black puffy jacket, dark jeans, and white shoes. University RCMP said a man appeared to be having a domestic dispute with a woman Thursday afternoon in the basement of the Center for Advanced Wood Processing. Another woman told police she tried to break up the fight but was then assaulted with a weapon. She suffered serious but non-life-threatening injuries. Police say the couple was spotted running from the scene in different directions. Anybody with information on the incident is asked to call police. A golden retriever stolen from his owner's yard in Kelowna has police on the hunt tonight. 18-month-old Atlas was inside the fenced yard on Taylor Crescent when a female suspect opened the gate. The dog then followed her as she ran on foot towards Birch Avenue. 
The suspect, described as Caucasian with blonde hair, she's wearing a dark colored jacket, a pair of pants, and a white toque when Atlas went missing. Anyone with information about the suspect or the dog's whereabouts should contact Kelowna RCMP. Johanna is back, uh, a little wet, uh, at least at sea level right now, but you say snow. <laughs> Did I hear you say snow? Oh, you heard right. I cannot believe it. Mere weeks away from spring, and yes, we are under a snowfall warning. Not all of Metro Vancouver, but parts of the city, and all of us do have a chance of seeing some small accumulations through the next couple of hours before this system clears out tomorrow. Right now, downtown Vancouver, this is falling as rain, but I want to show you the radar in a moment uh, because you'll see things have started to change over. Let's start with the temperatures, though. Uh, really not telling the story. Threes across most of Metro Vancouver. Uh, they are dropping quite rapidly at YVR. Uh, we're getting the atmosphere cooling from above, especially as that rain is falling. It's pulling down those cooler temperatures, so things are changing over to snow uh, a little earlier than some of the earlier models were showing. Here's a look at the snowfall warning. So not encompassing all of Metro Vancouver, uh, mainly for the northeast, uh, Coquitlam eastward, the valley and the north shore. That's where we could be looking at five to 15 centimeters, but not out of the question that we could again get a couple of slushy centimeters overnight tonight across the rest of Metro Vancouver. And indeed, thank you for your reports. I am seeing uh, snow at the higher elevations of uh, Burnaby, uh, Maple Ridge, uh, even uh, North Surrey getting uh, some wet snow right now that's beginning to accumulate. So here's that satellite and radar shot. The uh, pink is the rain snow line, but again, you can see how much it's fluctuating. Uh, it is going to continue to sort of dip and raise. I don't think that we'll see much snow down towards YVR and Delta, but uh, the night is young and we've got a few more hours to go. This is all thanks to a cold front uh, that actually slid down across the whole province. We've got snowfall warnings in place for the southern interior. This system already dropped 20 plus centimeters back up towards Kitimat and Terrace. So it is coming with a bit of a punch, but notice how quickly it clears out behind that cold front. That's quite a, a defined line in the satellite there. So that means we will get back to the sun before we know it. But taking you through the next 24 hours, I expect this rain snow mix to continue. And again, if you're in Coquitlam eastward, you will be looking at much higher accumulations. I'll take you through the timing and I'll show you that snowfall accumulations map coming up. And, and then I promise we will talk about double digits. We deserve it. Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jim. You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by Remax. What's your home worth? Find out with our instant valuation tool at Remax.ca. Following the recent measles outbreak in BC and a confirmed case of highly contagious whooping cough, media were invited on a tour of the Vaccine Evaluation Center at BC's Children's Hospital. The center researches the safety and effectiveness of new and old vaccines and looks at ways it can make them better. The center director stressed the importance of many members of the community, community being vaccinated against infectious diseases to prevent more outbreaks like the measles epidemic. He says vaccines aren't perfect, but they are effective. People have different reasons for, for being worried and anxious or not wanting to vaccinate. And I think it's really important that we listen to those parents and try and address the, the issues. Um, and I think sometimes in the media it gets very sort of hyped as these anti-vaxxers. But actually for, for most people we see and that I see in my clinic, they just want more information about the vaccines. And he says he's currently working on a project to better protect young babies from whooping cough because they're too young for their vaccinations. The project will look at how vaccinating women when they're pregnant will boost babies' immunity. And he says the current recommendation in Canada is for women to have an extra booster shot during every pregnancy. Well, once rebuilt, the White Rock Pier will be a lot sturdier than the previous one that collapsed during a windstorm back in December. The deck will be made of concrete, stronger so that it can support the weight of an emergency vehicle if it needs to. The city is stressing the pier will still look the same as the concrete will be overlaid with wooden planks. The hope is it will be reopened by July 31st. That should be nice, just in time, well, sort of halfway through summer. Yes, I think people were a little worried it was going to be a concrete slab, but now you hear it's going to be a portion. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, you can go more in-depth on today's stories by visiting us online at cbc.ca slash bc. You can also watch this newscast there streaming every day.
It's also available live and on demand on both Facebook and YouTube. You can find us by searching CBC Vancouver and make sure you are subscribed to both so you don't miss any of our reports. And tonight we begin a new series called Surrey, Why We Live Here. Coming up, the history and transformation of Walling. Well, a Vancouver family fears it could be sent back to the chaos in Venezuela. They are among the millions of Venezuelans who have fled the country since 2015 due to political upheaval. As our Premji reports, the family says going back isn't an option. Nine-year-old Arturo Tarazona Shivari has lived in Canada for as long as he can remember. They have been here for about five years. So they feel like they're Canadian more than Venezuelan. This is the only home he and his brother can remember, and it's where they say they feel safe. I just want to protect them. It's like, I, I don't know, like, I, I don't want them to, to see the horror. The horror Carmen Chivari is talking about is the political turmoil in Venezuela that has left the country in days of blackouts and without basic necessities like food and water. Uno. The Terrazona Chavari family says returning in the middle of the chaos is a real fear after realizing their nine-year-old son's study permit expires on March 19th and no one in Venezuela seems to be able to help. So if one of my sons doesn't have the permit, then we are in trouble because uh, we cannot allow him to go alone. We have to go all together. If we have to go there, it will be very, uh, you know, would be very, very problematic for us. It's uh, for all of us, and uh, it's going into the unknown. With the ongoing crisis, Canada's border agency website states there's an administrative deferral of removal. Now, this means a temporary measure to stop sending people back to their countries of origin during a humanitarian crisis. Now, when Canada feels a crisis has stabilized, CBSA will have the ability to continue removing people. If we can stay here in Canada, perfect, but if not, then we will have to go somewhere else, but going back to Venezuela is not an option for us now. This family has lived in Canada for nearly five years because their father is a PhD student, but in the end, this is the place they want to continue to call home. After coming to, to Canada, I have uh, fell in love with this, uh, with this country, with the culture, with the people. And they say they don't want to leave that behind just because of a glitch in paperwork while their home country is falling apart. The Venezuelan ambassador to Canada is set to hold a roundtable discussion with Vancouver's Venezuelan community in downtown at the end of the week. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. And Venezuela is now into a record fifth day without mm -hmm. power. Still a pretty chaotic situation there. And we're going to have a look at the unrest there later in this newscast. In the meantime, stick with us. We will be back with more local news in just a few minutes, including a look ahead to this week's homeless count in Vancouver. an interesting stat. Roughly 800 people move to BC's second largest city every month. And that's why we're kicking off our series exploring the richness and diversity of Surrey. Tonight our Jesse Johnston takes us to Wally as the neighborhood undergoes massive transformation. This is where many news stories about Surrey take place. 135A Street, the so-called Strip. This story is set here too, but it's not about the usual topics, homelessness or overdoses. This story is about one of Wally's most beautiful buildings. I'm right here beside the priest. To understand why the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of St. Mary is so special, all you have to do is spend some time with its members. It's part of my heart. I've been with it for 70 years, so I know, what it's, I know all the beginnings. Surrey's entire Ukrainian community feels a close connection to St. Mary's, but Bessie's bond is stronger than most. That's because she designed it by hand, using a photograph as a guide, way back in 1950. I drew on a piece of paper, and when we wanted to build a church already, we asked for a blueprint. 
well, that's all I have. I said, just design it on the paper. I said, I, we have no blueprints, we just built. Build they did. And gradually, the area around the church built up too. As Wally changed from agriculture to asphalt, its population changed with it. Jello fries with the jerk chicken. Immigrants like Isaac and Becky Takshi, who came to Canada from Ghana 30 years ago, make Wally one of the most diverse communities you'll find anywhere. It's a little bit concentrated with a lot of uh, different types of uh, ethnic people. Diversity is what he loves most about his neighborhood. As for what he loves most about his job, that's easy. He gets to work with his wife every day. It makes the marriage work better because we fight at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the we same get time, along. The same time we get along, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, who are you going to fight with? We're going home together, right? So we have to be happy together, right? Wally has changed a great deal since the church was built, and with 16 new high-rises on the way, it's about to change a great deal more. Great-grandson's wedding last year. Bessie says change can be a good thing, especially when you have a lifetime full of memories that will always stay the same. I still have this one. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. Yeah, part two of Jesse's series uh, tomorrow night at uh -huh. 6. Yes. And uh, now we're on to Vancouver's homeless count, which is set to take place this week. And with more than 600 units of temporary modular housing now built in the city, it's an opportunity for Vancouver to evaluate its aim to get people off the streets. CBC's Eva Ugensen spoke with housing advocates to get a sense of the progress. Every year, hundreds of volunteers head out to count how many people are spending the night on Vancouver's streets. It's a job that involves walking around the city over a 24-hour period to gather information about the city's homeless population. We are asking age, gender, um, Indigenous and ethnic identity. We're asking um, why people um, are sleeping outside, kind of the reason, the main reasons um, for, for not being, having a home. Last year, more than 2,000 people in the city were homeless. One of the province's solutions has been to build more than 2,000 temporary modular housing units. 606 of those are in Vancouver. 500 of them are occupied. But this city councillor is cautiously optimistic about the impact it will have on the overall number of homeless people. I'm hopeful we see that in the numbers of the count this year. And we know that the high cost of living is pushing more people into precarious housing or homelessness. So uh, I'm not so optimistic that we'll see a 600 person reduction, but I do think we're moving in the right direction in building these units. BC Housing says a shelter in Smithers will be able to close at the end of the month because of 24 new modular units in that city. Mobilis says more housing is great, but the solution isn't so simple. I definitely think we need more housing, um, but I think, you know, there are feeders into homelessness, so kids aging out of foster care, um, women fleeing abusive uh, situations and ending up in a transition house. There are lots of reasons why people fall into homelessness, and so I think it's not as simple as just building a unit of housing. And Boyle adds that the kind of housing being built doesn't address everyone's needs. Right now, the modular units we're building are for single people there's a real need for family housing particularly for single mothers single parents and so hopefully one of our next steps is to be building the types of modular units that families can move into as well this year's homeless count will be carried out in emergency shelters on Tuesday night while the street count will take place during the day on Wednesday Eva Yuguensenj CBC News Vancouver well out with plastic and in with paper some restaurants have already made that call now the ontario government is floating an idea that could see a complete ban on single-use plastics as adrian chung explains the plan falls in line with waste reduction efforts already happening across the world sunday brunch madness and the bartenders are running at full speed to fill the glasses what they won't be putting in any drink are plastic straws. Not a lot of people use straws, and if they don't use the straws and it comes with it, they just toss it off to the side, toss it on the floor, and it creates this massive waste that we try to mitigate. More and more restaurants and bars in Toronto are catching on to the no plastic trend, and they're now using paper bags, paper takeout containers, and of course, paper straws that are all recyclable. 
Now, the province is looking to back the idea. It's weighing the possibility of banning all single-use plastics like bags and bottles. Each person in Ontario generated nearly one tonne of waste last year, and much of that garbage ends up in landfills and beyond. These get into the water, eventually they break down into little pieces, which we call microplastics. Those end up inside the bodies of fish and turtles and everything else. And eventually they're in our bodies. And emerging science is telling us that we're full of microplastics now, and that's all because of the single-use plastics. The province's idea is in the early stages of consultation. The opposition NDP is ready to launch its own bill on eliminating plastics next week, seemingly one of the few ideas that's bipartisan at Queen's Park. This was an idea that had already been floated by the Liberals, to be honest with you, but there was a lack of decisive action. And I think that's exactly what we need to see here. We need, it needs to be ambitious. It needs to be decisive. People working in the restaurant industry say there's been a sea change in customers' expectations. You notice it most from the guests. Uh, they'll say things like, wow, like, it's great that you have a paper straw. You have plastic, I don't want to take it. No, we have paper for you. Um, so it's just sort of been a win-win-win. And in the dining room, not too many feel like they're missing out. Maybe five or six years ago, it was just really convenient. And now people understand, like, by using those single-use plastics, it's, like, affecting the environment heavily. Hopefully all restaurants and, in general, people, consumers, can support the idea and move towards being more sustainable. There's no clear timeline on when a legislative ban could happen, but for many restaurants, they've already started their own. Adrian Chung, CBC News, Toronto. The second time in less than six months, a new Boeing 737 MAX 8 aircraft has crashed. Coming up, will airlines stop using the planes amid safety questions?
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. We're running gravel trucks and this is delaying them by about a half an hour uh, each round, so it does add up to dollars in our pocket that we can't recuperate. Headaches for businesses and drivers as construction on a gas line through Burnaby and Coquitlam gets underway. Fortis BC says the work is likely to last right through the summer. Hopefully they uh, can provide the uh, jobs that they um, say they are, they plan to. Construction of a $70 million sawmill is bringing hope to Port Alberni after years of job decline. The investment comes as the BC government implements policy changes for the forest industry, hoping to see more wood and fiber processed in this province. The 18 Canadian victims of that deadly plane crash in Africa are being remembered tonight. At least one of them is from BC, Micah Misson, an environmentalist from Courtney. Like many others on the plane, he was on his way to meet other young leaders for the United Nations Assembly in Kenya. In total, 157 people died. And that crash has caused many to question whether it is safe to board a Boeing 737 MAX 8. Aircraft was involved in a similar deadly crash last October. The CBC's Susan Ormiston is on the ground in Ethiopia and has more on what might have happened to Flight 302. On the African plane, gouged open by a diving airliner, investigators work to answer the most urgent questions, how and why and whether this tragic scene connected to another precipitous crash less than five months ago. Gadisa Benti saw the plane hovering over his house Sunday, struggling with altitude. Then, nose down, tail in flames, he says it plunged. Pressure is intensifying on Boeing. Ethiopian Airlines grounded the rest of its 737 MAX 8 planes today. The incident was related with defects on this specific fleet. But we have taken this as an extra safety precaution. At least 24 airlines did the same, many of them in China, which ordered the entire MAX 8 fleet out of the skies. Air Canada, WestJet and Sunwing kept them flying, insisting confidence in Boeing's safety record, backed up by Transport Canada. Flight data and cockpit recorders were recovered partly damaged, but holding tight their clues. U.S. investigators have joined the Ethiopian aviation authorities slowly piecing together the mystery. And away from the crater, the painful forever. A young airline crew gone. An experienced young pilot with 8,000 flying hours with his inexperienced co-pilot only 200 hours. That will be a question on training too. There are two difficult jobs here now. One, a forensic investigation, and two, the recovery of 18 Canadians and 139 other lives lost just six minutes after takeoff. We know from previous catastrophic airline crashes, like in Ukraine, that the grieving is prolonged because it's so hard to positively identify from the scene who was on that flight. And part of the recovery now will be to collect little bits of people's lives. Shoes, documents, passports, journals, things that may be treasured by those left behind. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Addis Ababa. And here's a live look at Grouse Mountain tonight, where daylight saving time means more daylight for skiing and while there's plenty of snow up there there's even a bit forecast for lower down winter's not letting go just yet johanna's back with a full look at the forecast next
This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. Well, getting cold feet on a wedding day can be a sign maybe not to walk down the aisle. Mm -hmm. But it could be a sign you were just expecting to literally have cold feet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> An Alberta couple held their dream wedding this weekend outdoors. They knew it was going to be cold, but weren't expecting <laughs> minus 30 degree temperatures. Their ceremony was cut to 15 minutes and they had to cancel a planned hockey game. <laughs> Despite the deep freeze, the bride still says it was a perfect day. At least the sun was out. Yeah. I, was, I was going to say, yeah. And that puts our snow warning into a little bit of perspective there. It certainly <laughs> does, I know. I've already had somebody tweet me and say, I, I think I said spring was a couple weeks away, and they said, it's nine days. Let's not yeah. over-exaggerate the start of spring. So I'm sorry, you're right. It's we'll a have right double digits by then. <laughs> I know. We will. Yeah, we're very close. We just have to get through a pretty messy overnight. But let me take you through the time lapse. We started the day off on a cloudy but dry note. Note also the extra hour that it stayed a little darker out there. Certainly didn't help uh, Monday morning with the clouds rolling in. Uh, dry until the afternoon hours. Then we saw that rain begin to fill in. And now, as I mentioned earlier, we're beginning to see that rain change over to snow across parts of the south coast. Uh, it has been snowing across parts of BC, though, for the better part of the day. 20 plus centimeters back in Terrace and Kitimat. Snowfall warning still in place from the Peace Region down towards uh, the Kootenays and over towards Alberta. Uh, wind warning as the same system hops over the Rockies tonight. So it is fast moving. We will see things clear out. Quick look at those snowfall warnings down across the south coast from Whistler down towards northeast sections of Metro Vancouver and then the valley. That's where we're looking at 5 to 15 centimeters by tomorrow morning. Uh, look at the radar right now and again that snow line is dropping once again uh, down around 300-400 meters. So uh, higher elevations starting to see that wet snow mix in and areas inland cook Quitlam, Eastward, uh, North Surrey, Langley, starting to see that rain really change over to snow. And this is an all snow story for Maple Ridge out towards the valley. But southern sections of Metro Vancouver, I don't see, think you'll see much as far as accumulations. This is the latest run of uh, snowfall data. Note the island really not getting much as far as accumulations on uh, the coastal cities. Same story down towards Delta and Richmond, but Vancouver, uh, downtown Vancouver towards uh, North Surrey, this is where we're looking at a trace amount of snow. And then as you move up in elevation and inland, there's where we start to get our 5 to 15 centimeters, Maple Ridge, Abbotsford, Eastward, and even parts of the North Shore, again, with those snow lines down around 300 meters, uh, North Shore could be a bit of a, a bullseye overnight. It is fast moving, so you can see by 7 a.m. already that cold front sweeping things out. A little gusty through the morning hours as that cold front comes through, and the snow will linger a little longer, Abbotsford, Eastward. In fact, if you're Driving east uh, tomorrow, you'll be uh, chasing this system. I imagine that snow will uh, continue to accumulate on the mountain passes. Here's Tuesday afternoon, though. Clearing skies. I love getting uh, the uh, getting behind the cold front. Uh, we'll see that dramatic blue sky quite quickly move in. And with temperatures up around 7, 8 degrees, I think we'll see melting quite quickly across parts of Metro Vancouver. And we do get a fine Wednesday before the next blip that just looks like showers at this point. So big picture, here's that fast moving low along with the cold front. Lingering snow though tomorrow in through the Kootenays, Kamloops, Kelowna, Cranbrook. I think you'll get 5 centimeters down on the uh, valley floor. High pressure moves in nicely though for Wednesday and here's what the long range forecast will look like. Uh, building temperatures, little blip on Thursday uh, because temperatures will be a little milder by then. Just a few showers, doesn't look like a major rainmaker. Then we start to see temperatures really build. Our seasonal is about nine or 10 for this time of the year. It is a fine looking weekend and Let's note that that means we will likely have back-to-back spring-like weekends and uh, 14 on Monday. Oh. It has been over two months now since we have had double-digit temperatures. So Bring I, it on. I knew this would happen. I leave on Saturday for two weeks. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I, I should have laughed so hard. I know. It'll be waiting for you when you get yes. back. That's, that's, that's the way thing. it goes. It'll be fine. Uh -huh. It'll be fine. In just 18 days, Britain is leaving the European Union. It has a lot of British businesses wrestling with uncertainty. Coming up, we'll tell you what's at stake.
Well, just 18 days left until Britain is supposed to leave the European Union. And the prospect of pulling out with no agreement has many British industries wrestling with uncertainty. As Thomas Dagler reports, the situation is especially dire for lamb producers who may have to slaughter millions of animals. Welcome to North Stoke, England. Population 72 humans and several hundred sheep. There are about to be many, many more just at this farm, an extra 1,500 or more because it is lambing season, as it is every year right around this time here in Britain. These ewes, female sheep, are about to give birth to their little baby lambs. Those lambs are normally farmed for their meat, much of which is exported to the European mainland, except this year there is a big question mark over the entire British lamb industry, and that is because of Brexit. Britain is set to leave the European Union at the end of the month, but there's still no divorce deal ratified, meaning British lamb farmers are worried about deep tariffs being imposed at the end of the month, perhaps even additional sanitary checks imposed, which could cause chaos in the industry. These lambs that are coming out, that we're producing now, we still don't know what the market for them is. Um, we don't know if anyone's going to want them. We've already spent the money getting them this far. Farmers might have to try and sell them or slaughter them. You know, that's, that would be the worst case scenario. This little lamb was born premature about a week ago. Normally it could be processed for its meat and that could be exported to the European mainland within six months time. But this year, because of Brexit, there's a big question mark over that meat, over the whole industry. That's unless Britain and the EU can agree to the terms of a deal before the end of the month. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, North Stoke, England. Well, in the midst of all the unrest over Brexit, there is some celebrating happening in Britain. Today marks 70 years of the Commonwealth, Canada, one of the original members. The CBC's Kayla Hounsell was there as Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, visited Canada House in London. The annual Commonwealth Day service takes place each year here at Westminster Abbey. It is a day set aside for celebrating the shared values of the Commonwealth, peace, equality and diversity. All of the main members of the royal family are here. The Queen, Prince Charles and Camilla, Prince William and Kate and Prince Harry and Meghan. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex paid a visit to Canada House earlier today where they spent some time chatting with young Canadians who are living here in London and throughout the United Kingdom and working in a variety of sectors from fashion and the arts to business and academia. They were also treated to a performance by some Canadian throat singers and of course the youngest Canadians stole the show. Some Canadian children teaching Harry and Meghan how to make maple taffy on snow. The royals were also given some gifts for their own child. They're expecting a baby this spring and they were given uh, some mittens and a hat from the Hudson's Bay Company as well as a onesie with a maple leaf on the front and some Manitoba mucklucks. Now some people think Harry and Meghan's visit to Canada House on Commonwealth Day today is a sign of things to come. Uh, the fact that Harry and Meghan are coming here I think would indicate um, that at some point in the future they're certainly thinking about coming to Canada I mean, not least because of course the Duchess lived in Toronto and the link between Canada and the royal family is incredibly strong. In fact, the Queen has not been to as many countries outside Britain as Canada. And there are now 53 member countries in the Commonwealth. They have a combined population of 2.4 billion people, and more than 60% of them are under the age of 30, which is perhaps part of the reason we see the royal family placing so much emphasis on engagement with youth. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, London. More anger brewing in Venezuela tonight, which is now into day five of a countrywide power blackout. <laughs> Venezuelan opposition is blaming the outage on government incompetence and corruption. President Nicolas Maduro is accusing the United States of staging a cyber attack to create despair in the country. U.S. officials dismissing the allegation as absurd. One of the two women accused of killing North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's half-brother is now free. Prosecutors in Malaysia have unexpectedly dropped the murder charge against her. The Indonesian woman has returned to her home country. However, her Vietnamese co-accused is still in custody. 
Kim's estranged half-brother died two years ago in Kuala Lumpur after being smeared by nerve agent. No reason given on why the charge has been dropped. The other suspect's lawyer has already requested charges to be dropped as well. Workers' compensation boards across Canada are starting to cover the cost of cannabis more often. Not happening in B.C. yet, but other provinces are slowly beginning to change. Angela McIver spoke to one of the few Nova Scotia workers who now has her prescription covered by the government. Here in Nova Scotia, the doors are starting to open for workers who are prescribed cannabis. Guidelines are expected to be released next month that will help caseworkers and doctors define which patients should be covered. As it stands, there are only 10 people covered in this province. Melissa Ellsworth is one of them. She's been suffering from chronic pain since 2006 after being struck in the head with a chair at work. But it was only last year that workers' compensation started paying for her medical cannabis. After she took her case to a tribunal appeal and won. The first puff I took of the medicinal that I got, right away, I felt different. I felt like myself. Alberta and PEI each cover fewer than a dozen cases. New Brunswick has the highest number of approved claims with 71. Half of the provincial bodies would not say how many cannabis prescriptions are paid. Dr. Minaj Vora is chief medical officer at the WCB in Nova Scotia. Before, we actually said no to cannabis, but over the last year, we're starting to see that more evidence is coming, more more workers are asking for it and so now we're starting to develop criteria on guidelines for it as a position statement. The Maritimes and Ontario are the only regions that currently have cannabis policies for injured workers. Dr. Vora says he and his counterparts are still reluctant to cover cannabis, especially after they saw what happened with opioids. He says they want to learn from past mistakes by not over prescribing a medication without knowing the long-term effects. Angela McIver, CBC News, Halifax. Coming up, meet Robo Baby, giving birth to a robotic doll for medical training and hands-on teaching. Well, the Canada Rugby Sevens Tournament returned to BC Place over the weekend to much fanfare. 
Yeah, some people are still recovering. Uh, <laughs> it's become a tradition. Spectators showed up to the tournament, all sorts of colorful outfits to cheer on the squads. Vancouver is the sixth stop of the 10-leg World Rugby 7 Series, two-day event featuring 16 of the world's top teams. Canada won four of its six matches, including an upset win over Fiji, but ultimately finished in 10th place. If you missed all the fun this year, don't fret. Canada recently signed on to host the next four years. I was looking for you guys in the costumes. Oh, You're both there, right? Went what on, was uh, went on what, what did you dress up as, Mike? I, 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 I don't know. I you know what? Next time I will, because mm -hmm. it's so fun. There's so. Did we, you dress up? No, no. <laughs> we, we may know some people that did. Yeah. My yeah. husband was a sailor. Oh, that's pretty that. good. Yeah. <laughs> and we had a few CBCers here that uh, had some good. Yeah, yeah you guys so. took over. Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it looks like a baby, feels like a baby, and cries like a baby. <laughs> Uh, but that's where the similarities end with what you're about to see. That flailing, wailing newborn is actually a robot they have been programming uh, that lets them to mimic medical emergencies. So students, um, you know, they wouldn't normally face that. Now they can use this robo baby to train. Mm -hmm. But the dolls are made to look as real as possible. Their faces are 3D modeled after actual infants and they even have a realistic feeling skin. Uh, there are even adult sized dolls that give birth. <laughs> Okay. All Producer right. Matthew says he thought Did you guys run that story cute. to scare me? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is real. You not should robo. watch the robo birth first <laughs> and then <laughs> Thanks <Love> guys. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Have a great night. Good, Good night. night.